Well, the wait is finally over. In terms of uh, hype surrounding albums, I mean, Spirit Box's Eternal Blue, I think, would probably have to be, when I think about it, one of the most um, hyped albums of 2021. Everyone's just been looking forward to this, myself included. Uh, And I felt like they announced this album months ago. Like, I remember thinking when they announced it, wow, September is such a long way away. Uh, well, we're in September now. 2021 is a bit of a blur um, to me. <laughs> I can't really remember last week. Uh, all the days are blurring into one. So um, let's let's check out the record. We're gonna um, we're gonna skip over the songs we've heard. So there's 12 tracks on here. Uh, we've heard "Hurt You." We've heard "Secret Garden," "Holy Roller," "Circle with Me," and "Constance." Um, so we've heard five tracks from the 12 tracks on this record. So seven tracks we haven't heard, which is pretty good. Um, because a lot of bands release, you know, approximately, you know, 10 track albums these days. Uh, and had they released this as 10 tracks, uh, we would have already heard half the album, which would have been a bit of a bummer. But um, we've, we've got seven unheard tracks that we haven't heard yet. So I am stoked. Um, this is going to be uh, a little bit jumbled up as well. So I'm just going to cut this up. I'm not going to be streaming my uh, reaction to each song in its entirety. I'll be cutting out repetitive parts and kind of little thing, so it'll be more of a, a, a montage, but we will talk at the end about the song, um, what I liked about it, you know, just kind of little things I noticed, and then right at the end of this, we will talk about the album as a whole, and you know, whether or not it lived up to the expectations that people had of it, and just really kind of what I thought about it. We'll touch on a few things like production, songwriting, um, guitar tones, all that, all that kind of stuff in there. Um, this will be time stamped as well, so if you want to kind of skip around, please feel free to. Um, but other than that, let's let's get on with the first uh, track, Sun Killer. Sun Killer, not Killer. Okay, you got like cool little uh, electronic sort of vibe in the start. It's kind of like um, I expect to hear this in like a movie about a serial killer or something. That punchy bass with that um, Evanescence type Amy Lee vocals over the top. This is awesome. You can feel it building to something. I know Mike's going to be coming in soon with some awesome guitar thing. Probably some bends and scrapes. Knowing Mike. Oh, there it is. Oh, that guitar with the bass, it just sounds so heavy. So punchy. Ooh, what's going on here? Oh, we're building up to something. All oh, the vocals are getting more like demonic and distorted sounding. Oh shit, we're about to explode. Just give it to me. Come on, you're building this up. Just give it to me, Courtney and Mike. <laughs> I'm on the edge because I know what's about to happen. We know. They've done this to us before. <laughs> There's my bendy boy, Mike. Bend those strings, baby. I just need some scrapes in there now. Ah, there's a little scrapes at the end there. He didn't add them in when he was playing, but... Okay, well that was fir- that was the first track on the album, Sun Killer. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> what a track. Um, I love how it didn't just start off heavy, like... They could have just started this album off with a bang, like, you know, they could have just gone like, pow. You know, Holy Roller style with kind of, you know, just gone straight into it. But they chose to kind of, they had this, they built it up with this kind of electronic thriller horror movie type music. Um, they kind of eventually started adding stuff in there. And then um, then the vocals over the top, they reminded me so much of Amy Lee from Evanescence. Uh, that's a compliment because she's a really good vocalist. Um, and I know there, there's obviously some inspirations there um, of Evanescence being one of the inspirations for Spirit Box and Courtney's vocals. Um, pretty sure she's said that in interviews and stuff before. Uh, that's a phenomenal track. Um, I loved how it built the vocals in there were kind of, you know, there was like this anthemic, um, sort of element to it, kind of like where the notes are being held. Um, and she's just got such a great voice. Um, her ability to hold notes, but kind of, 
I don't know the way that she enunciates herself as well. It's just I don't know. There's just there's just something about it that I don't know. It's she's able to be heavy, but she's able to kind of push herself in all these different directions that I guess would make her appeal to like quite a wide fan base of people. Um, you know, her, her singing voice she could make it just as a singer alone without even screaming. You know, Spirit Box could be a heavy band with just the singing, and people would still love them just as much. Um, but I loved how this track was primarily just kind of singing. And then we kind of got the, you know, the heavier parts towards the end there. Um, I also appreciated the restraint from Mike as well to not just come in with the guitars straight up. I loved how we kind of, we built up to it. And then even then when Mike did come in, it was kind of a rather restrained riff on his part. It was, you know, do 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 And then it wasn't until the end where we got those Mike Stringer trademark, you know, uh, bends in there and kind of a little bit more groove in the playing, a little bit heaviness. And then that little sneaky scrape at the end there, um, cause I know he loves to throw those little, you know, Gojira esque string scrapes in there. And he's just so good at it as well. It sounds so good. Um, the production on this straight up is amazing. Um, the bass was just punching through. I mean, the bass tone is incredible. Um, uh, when you're playing in lower tunings like this, especially, um, you know, EQing and mixing and whatnot, it really matters because if you don't know what you're doing uh, in the drop F sharp tuning that they primarily use, things can sound muddy and the frequencies can get all messed up and it can just sound terrible. Um, so I, I know Mike for a fact is pretty well versed in EQing um, the guitars and the, the bass because Mike, I think, records guitars and bass and, you know, programs drums and whatnot. Um, just incredible. That's a really good way to start the album. All right, track number three, Yellow Jacket. Uh, this one was pretty highly anticipated because when people saw that Sam Carter was going to be featuring on this, um, people lost their marbles. You know, everyone's kind of speculating, what's it going to sound like? Is it going to sound like, you know, new architects? Are we going to hear the old Sam Carter from, you know, architects from, you know, five, six years ago? Um, you know, the speculation was running high and even I was curious how Sam would fit in this. Would he sing? Would he be screaming? Would he be doing his sing yell thing that he does? Um, either way, let's check out Yellow Jacket. Got some new new metal uh, industrial vibes here. Oh. That riff is filthy. We're getting this screamy Sam Carter. That's my favorite Sam Carter. Nice chorus. The singy screamy Sam Carter now. Oh, that's nice. I like that. Oh! Oh! Oh, shit! Oh man, this is nasty! Oh! Nasty! <laughs> wow! Oh, that synth in the background, I hear it. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, as many speculated, the the Sam Carter um, feature did not disappoint and might actually um, speculate. I'm speculating here right now. might actually be the heaviest track on the album. Um, that breakdown was so nasty. You know, it was kind of like this, you know, sort of chanty sort of back and forth sort of vibe. I love the build on there and Courtney's sort of, you know, um, industrial metal, you know, sort of Manson-esque almost actually type vocals in there. Um, and I was actually curious how Sam was going to fit into this song. And one thing that stands out that I'm really glad that they did, they didn't just use him for one little verse. You know, some bands will feature someone in there and they'll just feature them for one little part. You know, like I would have loved to have heard them in a little bit more on that. They utilized Sam for the large majority of that song, you know, over half, maybe 65% of that song was um, featuring Sam. It was incredible, but that breakdown, holy moly, that dun 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 that little, you know, messy little um, thing that he does where he mutes the strings. Um, wow. <laughs> wow. That song did not disappoint whatsoever. Um, 
one thing I did pick up on that track was the productions felt a little bit different to um, Sun Killer and some of the other tracks we've heard. Um, the guitar didn't sound as forward in the mix. It kind of felt like it was sitting back. Uh, and also the bass didn't seem to be as um, front and center as it was in Sun Killer as well. So it sounds like maybe on this record so far that we're going to get this kind of mix of different um, mixing and production styles on the track. So it's going it, to, if anything, that gives it a little bit of variety, right? You don't want a record that kind of everything kind of sounds like it's sitting within that same sort of um, musical band. You want, you know, you want some variety in there. I'm loving this so far. I really am. Um, okay, now we're on to track number four, The Summit. Um, let's just get into it. No features or anything on here. Oh, this is nice. I was looking for the wrong way out. Empty road is like an open mouth. If I say they're gonna cast me down. Wow. This is catchy. This is catchy. A little, um, the way she's enunciating those lines, catchy. <laughs> oh, nice little high note there. Oh. Oh man, this is catchy. This feels like a driving song to me. You put this in the car, and you, I can just picture myself driving at night on a dark road, you know, straight dark road, and this track playing. Oh, we got like a little vocoder effect or something over the top there. I do love it how they experiment with our vocal effects, it's really cool. How catchy is this song, wow. So catchy. A little Daft Punk, little vocal thing on the end there as well. Uh, that was the summit. Um, incredible. You know, we've had some heavy, we've had some heavy tracks, and now kind of, you know, there's this one thing that Spirit Box do really well is they're able to blur the line between uh, soft and heavy. And on on this track, they 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 did it again. <laughs> I mean, as as to be expected, you know that um, it's incredible, absolutely incredible. This this track was just so catchy. I don't know the lyrics on this track uh, just yet, obviously first listen, but that I can't sing, but um, that's that's the melody, right? Um, so catchy with the guitar underneath as well, the what a well-written song. I mean, the, the, the Spirit Box are just showing us that they could probably go in any direction. It's, it's crazy to think you know, we're four tracks in on this record of 12 tracks. Um, we've had a few of them already, as I said. But they've, they're showing that they can do so many different types of sound. Their versatility, and they could go in any direction on a future record. Um, you know, even if they went in the direction of this track right here, I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be disappointed. Uh, a lot of fans wouldn't be disappointed either if they, you know, even if they didn't have screaming. All right, uh, track number six, Silk in the Strings. Uh, cool song title. It's a pretty short time uh, for this track. It's 2.57. I don't know if it's going to be like a an interlude or if it's going to be just kind of like a, you know, a quick little fast track. Let's, let's find out either way. Oh! Oh, that's filthy. <laughs> I don't know when to bob my head. I don't know the timing. <laughs> nice little, uh, nice little thing on the drums there. Oh, what have we got? Oh, okay. I do love it when he goes a little bit chaotic on the guitar. Oh. Wow. That little symbol on the left-hand side of the speaker is messing with my head. Oh, yeah, boy. That's my bendy boy Mark again. Wow. 
Wow. <laughs> wow. When I saw when I saw the duration of Silk and the Strings was, was two minutes and 57 seconds, I was like, this is either going to be uh, an interlude, uh, although 257 is pretty long for an interlude, right? I don't know what I was thinking that. Or it's going to be in a short, you know, fast, loud type heavy track. And obviously that's what it was. Uh, incredible. You know, when I think of Spirit Box and I think of the heavier side of Spirit Box, I think uh, my mind instantly goes to uh, Mike's bendy sort of little things that he throws in. Uh, and, you know, that kind of little dissonance sort of stuff that he adds in there. And then um, obviously the scrapes and whatnot. No scrapes in the song, I don't think. But um, we got we got re- we got the bendy version of Mike on this track the whole way through. Uh, what a filthy guitar riff that, like, you know, terrible, uh, sounding out guitar. I'm so, I'm sorry about that, but, um, wow, what an impressive track. Uh, absolutely impressive. The variety on this record is just off the charts, you know, especially the order that they've chosen to put them in. It's just so well orchestrated the way they've done it. It doesn't feel like, you know, uh, kind of, it doesn't feel out of whack. It kind of feels like there's a progression in there. And they probably did put a little bit of thought into um, how they were going to structure these songs. All right, uh, track number eight, Eternal Blue, the title track from the record. Let's just get straight into it. Sounds like rainy day music. I like this song a lot already. Nice guitar riff. It's got a secret garden sort of vibe about it. Yeah, this sounds very similar to Secret Garden. Oh, that's beautiful. That's so beautiful. I'm getting Constance vibes from this track now. I think it's the um, the spaciness and the bass and the drums and the vocals. This is beautiful. Oh, we got a little groove down happening. No? Ah. Oh. oh, I love that little thing he's on the guitar there. Oh, what's this, like a solo or something? Oh, this is like, it feels like a very Tesseract type feel about this part. Well done. <laughs> ah, a little sneaky scrape at the end there. I see you, Mike. Uh, well, that was the title track, Eternal Blue. Um, first thing that stands out to me about this track uh, it, it felt like a mix between Secret Garden and Constance. Um, it kind of had that emotion in there. The guitars weren't the guitars were heavy, but they kind of how he let them ring out in between the chords there, and the chords sounded a little bit more fuller. Courtney's vocals sounded very emotional. Um, it was just a, such a beautiful track. I mean, that was a really beautiful track. I felt like they could have even used this track as the um, intro to the album. But I still think Sun Killer was the right choice because that kind of, you know, electronic build up. But this this track is just, it just encompasses um, Spirit Box beautifully. You know, it's heavy, um, it's emotive. You know, you feel something when you're listening to this, you know. It has a kind of, it, it has a sadness about it, actually, this song. Um, I actually don't know what it's about, but yeah, it had a, it had a little sadness vibe about it, you know, like Constance. Um, and I, I thought it was actually really beautiful. I really enjoyed that track. To me, this is probably, you know, one of the strongest tracks on the album. And, you know, I'm a guy that likes listening to the heaviest type stuff. But I know when Spirit Box do this softer stuff, it, it hits me. Um, and I, re- I really like it. Really, really, really beautiful. Really well done. All right. Track number nine, We Live in a Strange World. Um, before we get into this track, I just want to say I'm really enjoying this record so far. You know, the mix between uh, heavy and soft. Um, some of the tracks blend the both into the same one. It's just such a such a well done, put together record. And this is their first record, so um, this is impressive. So we've got another um, short duration track. There's only 248, so I don't know if this is going to be like a more softer interlude type track. Or are we getting another heavy track? Um, you really don't know with this record, so let's just get into it. I am coasting on nice dreams, lonely. 
This sounds like a track you'd hear on the radio, straight up. This is cool, um, nice production on the electronics. Not my favourite on the record so far, but still cool production. This is different, still cool, different. There he is. Sick chorus. This um very evanescent sounding part in this track again. Breakdown. No, no breakdown, that's it. That was We Live in a Strange World, track number nine on the record. I'll be honest, that's probably the first track on this record where I'm like, well, not really um, a big fan of that track. I mean, I'm not saying it's terrible, um, but it kind of, I don't know, it didn't appeal to me, you know, like some of the other tracks have. And it's not because it was really soft at the start and kind of radio sounding. I don't know, I just, it didn't feel... Um, it didn't feel as authentic as the rest of the tracks from a songwriting perspective. Kind of, to me, felt like more of a filler track. But, you know, um, there's no no such thing as a perfect band that, you know, writes just perfect songs all the time. And I feel like Spirit Box have been put up on this pedestal, um, you know, which for some people can be a lot of pressure and you can set a lot of um, people up to fail. But, I mean, one track that I, I didn't find, you know, I, I didn't really enjoy, but I didn't think it was terrible... Um, you know, of 12 tracks on a record, that's a huge accomplishment. Even if there's another another track that I'm not a fan of that we haven't heard yet, that's 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 awesome. I mean, there's not many albums that, that I can think of where I'm like, well, I like all the tracks except one. Um, even my favorite band, Thrice, you know, they've got albums. So I'm like, well, there's a few songs on um, some of their albums I don't like. So, all right, track 10, Halicion. I think that's how you pronounce it. Slightly longer than some of the other tracks that we've listened to so far. With a track name like this, I'm expecting a heavy track, but Spirit Box, you never know what you're going to get, so. Got some more electronics in here again. You can hear a little riff underneath building there. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. Love the enunciation on the vocals, how they kind of go up and down. Classic, you know, soft, heavy spirit box chorus. Catchy. By the way, the bass is stellar. How awesome does that bass sound? Chorus is so damn catchy. So many of the choruses just stuck in your head after the first listen. Wow, okay, uh, that was track 10, Halicion, and uh, I really enjoyed that track. Once again, um, quintessential Spirit Box. You listen to the song and you're like, yeah, that's Spirit Box. You know, it's soft, it's got heaviness, it's got catchiness, and then it's got like, you know, a, a filthy breakdown at the end. It's just all round, like, it just has that marker, that signature, um, Spirit Box signature. They've got a sound that just sounds, they, they sound like Spirit Box. Like, obviously, you know, they're in the, they play around in the metal genre and a little bit of progressive and, you know, genty, groovy, um, you know, slash alternative metal type sounding stuff. But, you know, to me, Spirit Box are kind of, they're in their own genre at the moment because, you know, they just sound so unique and there's no other band out there that I can think of that sounds like spirit box i mean there's influences i can hear in there i can hear like a fair bit of evanescence influence um but you know largely as a whole spirit box are their own sort of thing um now let's talk about this album as a whole so we skipped over the songs that you've probably played to death as well um but yeah let's get into the nitty-gritty of you know this record as a whole and did it did it live up to the hype as well you know um was it overhyped you know um, did they, was the band set up to fail basically by, by the fans? And the answer is no. Um, 
this this album is incredible and I'll go into the reasons why I really enjoyed this album and you know there might not be the reasons that everyone else likes this album but uh, let's start with the obvious ones here so production wise uh, absolutely stellar uh, production and mixing I should say um, just the way that the bass is so prevalent in a lot of these tracks um, it kind of amps up the heaviness of the guitar because when you when you're in this lower tuning, I think I explained this earlier in the video. Um, you've got to be careful because the frequencies in drop F sharp on the lower strings they can start to blend into bass territory. Uh, and if you don't know your way around an equalizer or have a producer who's kind of able to kind of you know clean it all up, it can get muddy and just sound disgusting and not very good. Um, but the one thing that you you hear on this record is that it just has a cleanliness about it. Um, the guitar tones, the bass tones, everything is just on point and just sits so well in the mix that you can actually pick things out and uh, it's really enjoyable to listen to. Um, you know, it doesn't sound too sterile, but it's just really enjoyable to listen to from a produ production perspective. Um, songwriting perspective, I mean, absolutely amazing. Um, you know, it's when's the last time you heard an, a metal album that was this catchy? You know, you've got catchy songs like The Summit, um, with that awesome little guitar riff in there, and it just, as a whole, like, even Holy Roller, I mean, Holy Roller is even a catchy song when you think about it, um, but as a whole, like, this album, like, the songwriting, um, that's being displayed on this, that, from the, you know, the heavy tracks to the softer tracks, it's just incredible, um, you know, the fact that they can write a chorus is, uh, amazing in itself, because, a lot of bands can't write choruses, and when they do, you know, they don't really turn out as, as well as they probably hoped. Um, but to me, a good chorus, you know, the number one rule is that it gets stuck in your head after you first after the first listen. Uh, every song on here that has, like, a, you know, a cool chorus just gets stuck in your head. You know, the chorus to Hurt You, for example, super damn catchy. Um, you know, even if you don't know the lyrics, if the melody gets stuck in your head, I mean, that's that's a hit, right? That's a hit. You know, if you can take that pop formula of writing a good chorus and put it into heavy music and make people get, you know, heavy music catchy like this, I mean, you've you've won the music lottery, uh, absolutely. Um, but yeah, as a whole, even the way that this record was structured, um, just everything felt like it was in its right place to me. Um, you know, Sun Killer as the opening track was obviously the right choice. Um, you know, the anticipation, the electronic stuff in there had kind of built up and then kind of exploded towards the end there. Um, that, that was, that's, that's how you start an album, you know. Uh, the cliche in a lot of heavy albums is you start out with your heaviest and fastest, most aggressive track, which is cool, has that wow factor. But to me, the way that they did it in a more restrained way, even cooler, in my opinion. Um, the only track I didn't really enjoy on this album was We Live in a Strange World, and I said that when we were listening to that. Um, wasn't a terrible song, but to me, it kind of felt a bit fillerish. And, you know, as I said, one bad track from 12 tracks, that is incredible. I mean, to have a 90% hit rate, uh, and, you know, just one, one track that just wasn't, just wasn't up to the standard I felt of the other tracks. I mean, that's, that's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. Not a criticism of the band at all. The fact that they could pull off 11 really solid, awesome tracks, um, it just shows how good Spirit Box are, and as we've got to think, we've got to think about this for a moment as well. This is their first album, you know. I felt like Spirit Box have been around for a while now, but this is their first album, um, and this is they haven't really kind of found their footing yet. You know, they're not a commercial band; they mostly existed as an internet band for a long time. They only started playing shows not too long ago, properly. Um, you know, the pandemic's obviously screwed with things, but. This, this is an incredible debut record. You know, there are bands out there that have been around for a lot longer that can't write albums half as strong as this. And um, you're not throwing shade at anyone else or making it a popularity contest. But for this to be a debut record this strong, um, with this much variety, it, they're just showing that, you know, they could go in any direction they wanted to. They could go in a heavier direction. They can go in a softer direction. They could sit in the middle like they've done with this record. And... You know, there's, there's sophomore record that's going to follow up to this, which they probably, you know, may have already started writing. They may have got some stuff left over. Um, it's just going to be, you know, it's going to be incredible. You know, Spirit Box are not going to be a band that are just going to drop this album and be like, you know, that's it sort of thing. They're just going to keep elevating as a band. And as they kind of work out the formula and find their footing, they are going to be a formidable force in music. Um, a lot of other bands should be on notice about Spirit Box because, 
you know, this is this is how you do it. This is really how you do it. Um, just everything from the production to the songwriting. Um, you know, the restraint the, the restraint on this album is incredible. You know, they could have just easily put out, you know, Holy Roller style tracks for everything or Constance for everything, you know, the tracks that people really resonated with. Um, but as a whole, this record is stellar. You know, if you're going to give this a rating out of 10, to me, this is, you know, a 9 out of 10. Um, this It's just an incredible sounding album. Really, I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, Yellow Jacket to me was the standout. I really liked the heavy stuff, but I know it was kind of hyped up Yellow Jacket because of Sam Carter, but it really, really was an awesome track. I love the way they utilized Sam as a feature. Um, it kind of didn't feel like he was featuring. It kind of felt like he was written as part of the song. Like it wasn't like a song. It didn't feel like a song was written and like, oh, let's get Sam in on it now. I'm sure that's probably how it happened. Um, but it kind of felt like Sam was a part of the song. It didn't feel bolted on or forced. Um, and yeah, just absolutely incredible. Um, really enjoyed this album. Really, really enjoyed it. Uh, Courtney and Mike and Bill and, and Zev should be really proud of what they've put out here. Uh, Mike especially because I know, you know, a lot of the instrumentation stuff and whatnot, the recording, you know, Mike, it's pretty much, it was a one man band sort of thing. Um, you know, Mike does a lot of the bass and the guitars, uh, programs, the drums and everything like that. And Zev will come in and obviously, uh, play them. And obviously you've got Courtney's vocals, which you already know are incredible, but, uh, yeah, really, you know, Courtney and Mike are just such a power duo. Um, and they've got a really good thing here, uh, especially adding Bill and Zev into the mix. Um, it's just an incredibly tight uh, force that I feel like is just going to explode. Uh, this album is going to take them places, and they really do deserve it because, I mean, they just all seem like such genuine, well-deserving people uh, who want to make good music, and they want people to enjoy it. And not only that, but Spirit Box is so actively engaged with their fan base. They really are an example for a lot of other bands to follow, I think, because, you know, if you're not a supporter of their Patreon, um, you should be. Um, they have a Discord. You can ask them questions. They're very, very receptive. Um, you know, I've asked Mike a lot of questions about his guitar tones and the writing process and whatnot in here. And, uh, you know, I always get a response to my questions. They're always willing to interact with their fans. Um, and to me, that's another reason why I love this band. You know, they care. They absolutely do care. And they've written such a great album. So we're going to end this here because it's a pretty long video, even with all the cuts and stuff I'm going to do in here. Uh, but seriously, go out, buy this album. If you can see a show, go out and see them, buy some merch. Um, I've got a bunch of Spirit Box merch stuff coming in the mail soon. So I'm really excited for that. I'm in Australia, so everything takes a lot longer to get to me. But uh, yeah, this band deserves our support. Please go and support Spirit Box if you enjoy their music. Um, you know, don't just go and stream the music on iTunes or Spotify or Spotify, um, it's not Spotify, on YouTube, uh, actually buy some of their music. You know, the pandemic has affected a lot of people, and I know their cancelled shows that they were doing with Limp Biscuit did actually affect them. Um, so just go and support this band, please. And uh, until next time, if you made it to the end of this video, as always, I appreciate your time, and thank you for watching.